buying stalls. And he scraped its tail along the runway to simulate too steep a takeoff. Above all, the authorities wanted to check the plane could be evacuated in just 90 seconds. The 747 would be carrying more passengers than ever before. A single accident could kill over 400 people. But soon the 747 was passing with flying colors. Not least because Sutter had installed unparalleled safety features. Three backup systems that would keep the aircraft flying, even if only one was working. This was his most important value in, in designing the 747. It was the thing that kept him awake at night. What would happen if it crashed on its first flight? It would, it would, it would have been the end of the Boeing company. We did, a, I think, establish a new standard for uh, airplane design. And I, uh, later on, I think most people tend to follow that, not maybe as well as the 747, but uh, you'll see that safety going into all of the more modern airplanes. But it wasn't long before the tests hit what every aircraft designer considers their worst nightmare, the seven-letter F word. Flutter. Increasing speed to Mach 0.7. At certain speeds, as wind tunnel tests show, flutter causes violent vibrations that can shake an aeroplane apart. Pan Am and others wanted us to design an airplane as fast as we could, which meant that we had to thin the wing and sweep the wing. And that can cause a condition called flutter. And if you tame flutter, that's fine. But if you don't, you can lose a wing. The wing was a miracle of engineering, based on Nazi swept wing designs of the Second World War. It could change its shape to suit every flying condition. Massive triple slotted flaps unwound to give 90% extra lift at slow speeds. The wing did all this, yet could be bent at the tip 20 feet before breaking. But the dangerous flutter threatened the entire project. Jack Waddell deliberately pushed the aircraft into the danger zone. To explore the flutter area, which came normally with a certain airspeed and altitude, uh, you would approach it very cautiously by only advancing your speed a little bit at a time. Mach 0.8. The flutter started. You knew you were in dangerous territory. It's a very dangerous uh, phenomena and has to be carefully controlled. Okay, decreasing speed. But normally that meant right away you backed off. You pulled the throttles back and you slowed down. As soon as you slowed down, then you left the danger area with some more information. After a month of hard flying, they worked out a fix. Small heavy weights at the tip of the wings dampened the vibrations. We did control it. We found the answers. We got it done, but it took a lot of time. Time that Boeing didn't have. While the tests raced ahead, anticipation of the new jumbo was building on this side of the Atlantic. They said the jumbo couldn't be built. No factory could hold it. But Boeing leveled a mountain and built the biggest factory in the world. And the revolution in our travel habits begins in only four months. Catering vehicle at door one, starboard is elevated. Investing millions in new facilities, airlines rehearsed arrival day of the new giant. The starboard air conditioning vehicle is positioned and started. The cleaning vehicle at door five, starboard is elevated and cleaning of the rear toilet starts. International airports were expanded to create massive hubs ready for the passenger explosion that was to come. 
but all the preparations would be for nothing if the engine faults could not be fixed. With only months before the first 747s were due to go into service, production models started piling up outside the Everett factory. Very few of the airplanes ever had engines on them. They usually had a concrete block hanging off of the pylon where the engine is supposed to mount. The concrete blocks stop the aircraft from tipping up on their tails. With all these grounded aircraft, the company was closer than ever to bankruptcy. I think everybody at Boeing felt that uh, we had a very serious engine problem and Pratt & Whitney just wasn't taking it seriously enough. They may have been working on it, but we didn't feel they were working hard enough. Test pilot Jack Waddell decided it was time to give the engine manufacturers a wake-up call. He took the president of Pratt & Whitney for a ride and showed him the problem. It was a very dramatic demonstration because those surges always created a loud boom. To prove it wasn't just one rogue engine, Waddell throttled up number two. He was about to do it again, and the Pratt guy said, I got it, I got it, I understand, yeah, okay. And uh, that test was over. Jack uh, was merciless. He had no sympathy for him. The showdown paid off. The cause of the flameouts was found. Under certain conditions, the large front fan distorted the inner engine casing so that it no longer made a snug fit around the spinning turbine blades. This caused the air and fuel mixture to break up and explode. But by simply stiffening the casing, they hoped that they had solved the problem. Engineers raced to fit the engines. The jumbo at last could go into service. For Joe Sutter, it had been a long, hard battle. The fact that we got the airplane done in time and it was a good airplane uh, is uh, attesting the, how well the people that worked with me uh, did their job. But it was a fight all the way. At 7 p.m., the first fee-paying passengers took their seats for the inaugural flight from New York's JFK to London Heathrow. It was quite a media event, as you might imagine, uh, with celebrities. The airplane taxied out, and all of a sudden, we see the rotating beacon coming back toward the terminal. And it was reported that they had an engine problem. The passengers were brought back to the terminal. I'd rather be off than on. Any sense of fear? No, I mean, they said something was burning, and we got off. Something was burning. It was an engine. We saw molten metal in the tailpipe of the engine, which meant that the engine had to be replaced. There was no time. Pan Am switched to a standby aircraft, hoping no one would notice. I do remember that we re the name of the airplane to the inaugural uh, name. After a six-hour delay, the 747 eventually took off. While in London, everybody waited. I think the man who wrote this on the top of a press handout from Boeing will have a very, very red face indeed this morning. He's right, we haven't. It had not been the launch Pan Am or Boeing had hoped for. But when the tired passengers did eventually land at Heathrow, the 747 was met by excited crowds. No one had ever seen a plane this size before. Soon, jumbos started crisscrossing the globe. With its spacious twin aisles, the 747 quickly became a success with the public. What do you think, George? Harriet, don't rush me. TV ads sung its praise. 
Even engine manufacturers Pratt & Whitney were eager to announce the age of the wide-bodied jet. Harry, we'll take it. <laughs> the 747, the 70s way to fly. Beautiful. The 747 became the must-have airplane. It was the plane to have in your fleet. It was the flagship of any airline fleet, and you just didn't have an airline unless you had a 747. Well, the 747 was an immediate hit. It was the epitome of the jet age and luxury air travel. Look at that. For the first time in history, people could travel cheaply yet quickly from continent to continent. The world has shrunk, they say. It's true, in the sense that air travel has brought places closer in time. The world is smaller. In the first six months, the 747 had taken a staggering million passengers. Return transatlantic flights dropped by almost a half to just over a hundred pounds. And for airlines, the jumbo was a cash cow. Oh, I think they're marvelous, wonderful machines. They're more like a uh, flying town hall, I should think. But it wasn't just cheap seats. The Jumbos introduced a new age of luxurious air travel. The company responsible for the new interior design and the world's first overhead locker was Walter Dorwin Teague Associates. We did actually go through a period where day glow colors and upholstery were actually very, very popular. And uh, we, we did some things there that I think probably today we'd look back and kind of <laughs> not be so happy with, but they were really beautiful at the time. The Jumbo was transforming the aviation industry. With up to 16 cabin crew to each 747, airlines recruited more staff. Pan Am stewardess Emilia de Guia started working on 747s when they first entered service. Pan Am was the iconic airline. I would not have flown with any other airline. They were very strict about weight. We were not required to wear girdles, but we had to be slim. Amelia soon developed a love affair with the aircraft, not just with any 747, but one of the first that Pan Am ever bought. Clipper America, registration N747PA. It was love at first sight. She was an amazing vision. It was a relationship that would last 40 years. But it started badly with the first serious accident to involve a jumbo. I was on Clipper America, and we were fully loaded fuel-wise to go from San Francisco to Tokyo when we hit a big problem. Miscalculating his takeoff speed, the pilot hit the runway lights. We took one beam with us. It came with us right through the belly, and it went through four rows of seats. Those four seats miraculously were not occupied. Otherwise, it would have been human shish kebab. <laughs> There was one person not so luckily located before the beam came up from the floor and it amputated his foot. The accident had severed three of the four hydraulic systems and damaged the landing gear. The situation was critical. They had no alternative but to attempt a landing. We start to make our descent. It was the loudest landing. It was 
a miracle.